So it's my pleasure now to introduce the first of our panels. The way that the panels work, there are three uh, presenters in the panel who will give you a 10 minute overview of their specific work. And then it, the session will be have Q&A for 15 to 20 minutes, which will be moderated by one of our certificate students. So this first panel is the social policy panel. It focuses on how DSRP and the agent-based approach can be used to meet the needs of humans. This panel features three current MPA graduate fellows who are only a week away from graduation, which is awesome, uh, maybe two weeks away. Uh, this panel is uh, going, to, the panelists are going to share their insights into several important social policy issues, suicide prevention, the mental health of LGBTQ plus youth, in the education system, and also the analysis of current trajectory of New York mothers' labor market outcomes. This panel is going to include three of my favorite students, Vimbai, Uriah, and Jillian, and is also moderated by one of our certificate students, another one of my favorites, Michelle Parks. So without further delay, I know we will start with Vimbai. You're muted right now. Nope, I cannot hear you. Does anybody hear her or is it just me? No. Don't worry, we build in minutes for this, so we're okay. Let's see if we can figure it out. Anything now? Yes, now we hear your lovely voice. Okay, now, perfect, perfect, you, you wanna go ahead and share your slides and then we'll get you started. Yes. Okay. We're still on time, so don't worry. Just take a deep breath. It's all good. Okay, how is it looking? Can you see my slides now? Uh, I still see your beautiful face. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get to the bottom of this. Let's see what's going on here. No worries. So you just need to hit share your screen and highlight your slides. Yep, that's what I'm doing. Uh, it doesn't seem to... This is good, Mumbai, because now you're going to let all of the <laughs> panelists know that we will handle yeah. this with grace and no problem. Yeah. So uh, you should hit the share screen, the green button, and then the little character. Yeah, that's, pin your that's exactly what I am doing here. Uh, it might be underneath one of your other windows. Um, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. Uh, there you go. Oh, See? finally. Okay, awesome. Sorry, everybody. Oh, oh no, great. what I'm seeing is your screen and the audience. Uh -huh. faces. So that's not, the, you have shared a screen. It's just not your slides. Okay. So go over to your slides and, and you should be okay. Okay, so um, window. So now we know share screen works. We just have to find the right screen. Okay, great. Do we see slides now? No, I still see your beautiful face. <laughs> okay, let's see what's going on here. So share screen, um, window, and share. Still nothing? Not yet. Hmm. I believe in us, don't worry, we're fine. <laughs> uh, do you have your slides, your slideshow open? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, so. Let me just click that and I'm pressing share now. Still nothing? No. Um, do we want to maybe. Um, yep. So uh, why, yeah, yeah. Why don't we do this? Uh, Alina will pin Uriah. Mm -hmm. we'll get your, Uriah will get you all ready to start and then we'll loop Vimbai back in at the end. Sounds good. Thank All you. Right. We'll figure it out. Right. Hi, Raya. Look at that beautiful face. Another beautiful face. Now let's Hi. see if we can get your slides up and then we'll get you started. I appreciate your flexibility. Of course. Let's see. I still see you. 
Yes. Uh, let's see. Can you Matt. see it? That's... Good job. Yes, that's right. All right. Awesome. So we'll let you get started and then you can introduce Jillian. Jillian will bring Vimbai back on and then we'll go to Michelle for moderation. All right. Sounds great. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Uriah Blue. I'm a second year uh, MPA student studying at Cornell University. And today I'm really excited to speak to you about the issue of mental health in the LGBTQ plus youth uh, in our education system and uh, how I have applied an agent based approach or ABA into exploring this topic. Um, so first, during this talk, I'll be referencing what's known as Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. And these type and Title IX has been instrumental in curbing the discrimination in the education system. However, Title IX currently does not extend these you know, protections to sexual orientation and gender identity. And this is part of an overarching wicked problem within the system. So the wicked problem I'll be speaking about today is really on the issue of discrimination and inequality in education, uh, especially as it pertains to sexual orientation and gender identity. And also the mental health consequences of the systemic wicked problem. Uh, so some interdependent factors such as federal, state, and school policies are major factors in influencing the mental health of LGBT youth in uh, public education. A solution to kind of help with this wicked problem was proposed on September 23rd of 2022, and this proposal would introduce new Title IX amendments to the Education Amendments of 1972. Essentially, these new amendments would extend Title IX protections to cover sexual orientation and identity uh, within federally funded education institutions. And as mentioned earlier, I used the ABA approach when researching this topic. So. What is an ABA? First of all, um, it's what's known as an agent-based approach. And in systems thinking, it's a method that focuses on, you know, the individual agents and their behaviors and interactions within complex adaptive systems, also known as CASs for short. Um, and just why ABA? Uh, ABA really proved to be a fitting method, especially when examining these systems related to mental health of the LGBTQ plus youth. And ABA really helped me take a step-based approach to break down this really complex system with a lot of different actors, uh, especially make it into something a little more digestible. So distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives, or DSRP for short, is really an inher inherent to analyzing these three systems uh, I've identified, and those would be mental health, uh, education and title IX. And, you know, just a prevalent example of how these systems have really interacted with each other would be the Supreme Court case in uh, Bostock v. Clayton County. Um, and this was settled in 2020. But essentially, this case stemmed from the fact that Bostock was fired in 2013 for his sexual orientation. And the court ruled that he faced discrimination that was in violation of his Title VII rights of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and in short, this case really became the foundation for these newly proposed amendments to Title IX uh, in regard to sexual orientation and uh, gender, gender identity. So when comparing the DSRP structure to empirical research, the DSRP analysis uh, coincides with generally agreed upon findings. Uh, research from the Annual Review of Clinical Psychology found the, that minority stress theory can also be applied to sexual and gender minorities. Oh, apologies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did not mean to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, so these can be also applied to sexual and gender minorities. And um, for example, like a meta-analysis from 2011, found that the rates of depression and suicidal tendencies are much, much higher in LGBT youth by a ratio of 2.9 compared to their non-queer like queer peers. And to help visualize this complex system, I used ABA and DSRP to create a map outlining all the distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives that affect LGBT youth. 
And this screenshot is only like one very small part of this overall CAS system. Uh, in particular, this part of the map shows some of the relationships surrounding Title IX discrimination. And just in this example, we can see how this set precedent on the right side of the screen informs school policy on issues like bathroom policies, for instance, while the Equal Protection Clause would help inform state policy on areas such as athletics. Uh, and on the left side of the screen, we can see the relationship shared between trans and non-conforming students as these issues of bathroom policy and athletics are directly impacting these individuals. So to fully express how complicated this issue really is, uh, I did create a GIF that kind of moves around through some of the more crucial parts of my map. Um, like for instance, how court interpretations of the education amendments have helped inform Title IX over the years. Uh, and it's provided like various exemptions such as private schools, non-vocational, and religious educational institutions. Uh, or, or for instance, how seemingly minute individualistic characteristics, such as factors like age range, personal nutrition, social relationships, uh, all share some sort of relationship with mental health. Now I'd like to break this down into something even more digestible, um, just in this CAS analysis. So salient agents, simple rules, and system level behavior. And first I wanna clarify that these are by no means all of the salient agents. Uh, this is just to make it more comprehensible. And you might also notice on the right side uh, under system level behavior, I don't have anything listed out there. Uh, that's simply because these system level behaviors are very complex uh, compared to that of like simple rules that the salient agents would follow. Uh, like, for example, when observing non-LGBTQ students, uh, they might follow the simple rules of, you know, they attend school and they socialize, but that doesn't fully explain their, like, system level behavior within the CAS. So when we examine that system level behavior, we can see that non-LGBT students do do that. They attend school and socialize, but they can also take different perspectives, such as being allies or accidentally perpetuating bias or microaggressions, and it really just depends. It's uh, very complicated. And now I wanna kind of move into the pause wood, and this is the purpose of a system is what it does. And what are these systems actually doing? What are the outcomes? And by focusing on these outcomes of systems, we can identify and address these potential issues with these systems. So as mentioned earlier, um, I have set up three systems that play a role, and that'd be mental health, uh, yeah, mental health, the education, and Title IX. And as you can see, edu the education system is currently underfunded and has very limited like gender and sex education, while Title IX just doesn't protect our kids, like our LGBT youth. And mental health is currently lacking resources. So whenever I was constructing this, I wanted to project what a future could look like of the system. What could the future system actually be doing to address these problems? So first, I said the education system could really use some adequate funding and some form of sexual education mandate. And Title IX protections could also be afforded to LGBT students if the policymakers adopt these proposed amendments for Title IX. And the mental health problems could be greatly minimized by providing or expanding resources like telehealth, uh, counseling, and you know other things to help address issues of like depression, self harm, and substance abuse, while also fostering a very inclusive, supportive environment. And these are really some of like the root differences in how these systems currently operate and what their purpose could be in the future. So. Before I get into you know, recommendations, uh, I did set in place a rubric um, and these rules and recommendations will be following this rubric. So first, these recommendations must be non-discriminatory in nature. Second, they must provide an inclusive environment. Third, they must provide adequate resource availability for students. And fourth, they must engage with and support LGBT youth outside of school. 
now I just kind of want to run through these recommendations. There's only five of them. Um, but recommendation one is to create inclusive environments safe for LGBT youth in and out of school. So this could be like after school programs, right, to help foster. We're doing some outreach in community. And recommendation two, provide adequate resources for mental health, things like student disability services, counseling, telehealth hotlines, right? Recommendation three, the enforcement of new Title IX amendments by the Office for Civil Rights would be a necessity. Um, the enforcement of these amendments would really have to be enforced, right, for significant change. Recommendation four, awareness and information about the LGBTQ community, especially in today's political climate, is a necessity. There's a lot of very negative stereotypes around the community that would need to be cleared up and education and awareness campaigns would really help with that. And recommendation five, um, finally, just like, you know, some mandate of some level, and this would have to vary state by state, but putting in a federal mandatory, um, you know, sex and education within the school system. Uh, so yeah, currently these systems have really been failing our LGBT youth. Uh, Title IX just does not protect them, like currently. And the mental health of these children and young adults are statistically much worse than, you know, their non-LGBT peers. And they need a system that stops failing them and will actually protect them. So yeah, thank you. Oh, and I guess uh, I should introduce, yeah, this is uh, my friend, Jillian, we've worked together in the past as well. Hi, um, so I am going to be presenting today on um, paid family leave and how it impacts working mothers. Um, and um, I wanted to start off by talking about the fact that there are many reasons to prioritize mother's labor force attachment in policy development. Um, I could discuss how motherhood and financial dependence are both risk factors for intimate partner violence, or I could discuss the implications of motherhood penalties for single mothers or even just the cost of living for single income families. But I've decided to keep it simple and just talk about what mothers think is ideal. Um, so according to a Pew Research Center survey of nearly 10,000 people, the majority of all mothers sampled, um, which was 81%, stated that working in some capacity would be the ideal scenario. This 81% majority was not made up of mothers that have chosen to work part or full time alone. Um, in fact, when only stay at home mothers, meaning 100% of those sampled who were not employed part time or full time, when they were asked what would be ideal for mothers of young children, 69% responded that some level of employment would be best, which is obviously a pretty substantial gap. So in order to learn more about this issue um, and solutions to it, I started by looking at maternal rights in the state that I've lived in my entire life, which is New York. Um, in 2018, New York implemented a paid family leave policy that was incredibly generous compared to what is offered through the majority of the country. Um, but unfortunately, due to the novelty of New York State paid family leave, we don't know much about what the policy outcomes will be. What we do know is that internationally, there has been quite a bit of evidence showing that paid family leave programs help mother's labor market outcomes improve by in, um, enabling return to work. Um, increases in hours worked and um, wages. And in the United States, um, although there is unfortunately not much to draw on because there is only one policy in California that has been around long enough to build a strong literature base, um, which is the 2004 California paid family leave policy. Um, we do know that the initial results were very promising with um, pretty substantial increases in mother's employment rates, hours worked and wages in the first year to a few years after childbirth. 
But the long-term results presented in 2019 by um, Bailey and colleagues were unfortunately disappointing. And they showed that not only were the substantial gains that mothers made in labor market outcomes, not only did they decline quite a bit, they also, um, there was also seen a negative relationship between first time mothers and um, hours worked and wages, unfortunately. So it's not well understood why this change happened over the next 10 years, but um, I wanted to take a look at this in the context of New York. Um, so what we know about um, New York's paid family leave policy is that in the it expanded upon previously guaranteed maternal rights um, from the Family and Medical Leave Act, which was 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Um, they it allowed for 12 weeks of partially paid leave to mothers, um, and it has increased a substantial amount of the leave taking among mothers. It has um, also led to more leave taking in general. Um, but like both policies um, in California and in New York, you've really only seen a couple of more days of fathers taking leave. There's nothing really substantial there. And we don't know what the long term results were going to are going to be. Um, so in structuring my first map that I created using the information I had access to from California, I used the state's policy as a case study for what to expect in looking at New York state's policy. The details on this map aren't particularly important, other than the fact that this section shows policy details, like the fact that it was um, at the time a six week leave at 50% wage replacement that has increased now. Um, at more significant is the fact that on the um, right on my right hand side, um, the short term outcomes are separate from the long term outcomes. Um, so a couple of days of father's leave taking, but pretty substantial increases in mother's labor market outcomes with a pretty substantial fall over the next 10 years. In New York State, although the policy details were slightly different um, than the California California's policy, there was no reason to believe that fathers will be taking more than a few days of leave or that the outcome structure will look very different because New York's policy was not designed with a split between short and long term outcomes in mind. So in viewing the purpose of the California system as what it actually does, which is prioritizing short term and unsustainable gains over real improvement and understanding that New York system is designed with the same basic structure. It's clear that without intervention, paid family leave in New York State may follow the sim a similar trajectory to what we saw in California. In order to figure out a starting point for a system that does not reproduce the same disappointing long term outcomes, I looked directly at what mothers had to say. Um, I am working on this for my master's thesis and was lucky enough to have data from my pilot survey. Um, so in order to bridge the gap between PFL systems and their outcomes, I created this approximation of the ideal system using data I collected, um, asking mothers what their ideal leave would be. I had 14 responses um, to that question in particular, and they offered pretty detailed um, qualitative data on what would be best for them. And I combined this with the Pew Research Center, da Center data that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation for um, modeling the long term outcomes. So the ideal leave policy structure was based on a synthesis of recommendations offered by 14 different mothers throughout New York State. Um, and among the mothers that mentioned pay, they often said that full pay would, would be ideal. Um, they, the majority stated that they wished that they could have around six months up to a year was pretty frequently stated. Um, and they also stated that it would be nice to have um, a transitionary period back to work and that they wished that their partners could have the same type of leave time. Um, now, once I had these three maps to compare, I was able to start a CAS analysis by isolating the system's most salient agents, which were working mothers, working fathers, employers, and the economy. 
Once I identified these agents, I was able to determine their simple rules and the behavior that occurs as a result. And this included things such as birth mothers requiring recovery time and therefore needing to take leave immediately after giving birth, families needing to maximize their income and therefore one parent, typically being the father, needing to stay at work full time. For employers, an example was that they needed to minimize immediate employment gaps and they therefore deal with employee absences reactively. Um, and then one simple rule that is very relevant to myself and everyone watching this talk right now is that in order to maintain the economy's current structure, people need to continue having kids. So when you think about this simple rule on the emergent properties for that, they do have far reaching implications about the relationship between personal choice, autonomy and motherhood. Um, that are very important to consider in the larger context of um, other policies. And this has, um, once I finished my CAS analysis, I, it has allowed me to establish a recommendation rubric, which I want to pause on because this is the real deliverable for my project, in my opinion. Um, I created recommendations as well based on the, this rubric but they don't solve the issue of labor market motherhood penalties on their own. For example, I'm very um, aware of the fact that they fall short for su offering support necessary for single mothers. However, I do think that this rubric can be used and also expanded to create solutions that take a multitude of different perspectives into account without reproducing the same outcomes. So looking at leave structures that make sure that no mothers are rushed back into work when they aren't physically healed yet, um, and making sure that no policy encourages fathers to forego leave, making sure that you're not disincentivizing childbearing are all really essential for making sure that these policies are successful. Um, and with that said, these are the recommendations that I developed. The first two, um, which are more public policy oriented, cover both the expansion of existing programs and a tax or subsidy incentive that encourages equitable leave taking within individual firms. Um, and then on the firm level or um, individual organization level, I have also um, established two recommendations. Um, first, focusing on smoothing out leave taking in a way that is beneficial for all parties. Um, but I am very excited to continue working on this topic more, and especially now that I have the recommendation rubric that I produced, I am hoping to continue looking for policy recommendations as more data become available from state level policies in the coming years. Um, so thank you all so much for listening. Um, I'm excited to hear any questions, and I am also very excited to announce Vimbai. Um, Thank you. So let's try this again, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eleanor, for um, having my slides up for me. So the project I'm about to share with you guys today came as a result of the passion that I have for my uh, college community and home uh, here in Ithaca. Back to the first slide. Yeah, right there. OK, so um, yeah, let's keep it there for a little bit. So the project I'm about to share with you today, guys, came as a result of the passion that I have for my community here um, in Ithaca, New York. This body of work was initially intended for a class, but uh, soon evolved into something a little bit more special and significant. So my talk today was designed to raise the awareness uh, of suicide prevention here in Ithaca, New York, uh, through my uh, paper that I wrote called The Multi-Agency Approach to Suicide Prevention. Above, I have this quote that I found is very simple, but yet eye-opening. And it simply says that there is no health without mental health. So the irony in this uh, particular statement is that the mental health, which I feel like is often neglected or given less priority in healthcare uh, systems, as well as conversations, can actually play a significant role in determining the overall health outcomes that we see today. The statement just goes to highlight the need for a more holistic uh, health approach, healthcare approach that recognizes that interconnectedness between the physical health systems that we see, as well as the mental health systems that we see. We can go to the next slide. So when we interact and look at the systems that we care about, like on a daily basis, what we tend, people often see the systems they care about and all they see is the emergent properties or simply put the observable outcomes of these systems. The observable outcome that brought me here today to be able to present this to you and to write this paper that I wrote is that I found that Tompkins County has averaged over 12 deaths per year since 2016. 
this is a cause of, this is a cause for alarm for a city that is a home to such, so many several colleges. So through learning systems thinking, I discovered that the solutions um, that we that, that will solve these emergent properties as well as these observable outcomes of the VUCA complex adaptive systems we care about so much lay in understanding the underlying dynamics that drive the system. Next slide, please, Eleanor. So concerned concerned about like these suicide death numbers in Tompkins County, I set out to understand the suicide prevention framework of this county through applying the ABA uh, approach, also known as the agent-based approach. The very first thing that I did was I set out to map the system using a tool called Platica. And as humans, I find that we have these inherent biases based on our life experiences that have a tendency to influence how our mental models uh, how the how our mental models have formed and prevent us from objectively examining a system. So our mental models, as a lot of us will know, are shaped by our individual life experiences as well as biases. And these can lead to us imposing our own beliefs as well as expectations onto the system rather than taking a step back and understanding it for exactly how it actually functions. So my main focus on this stage of the ABA uh, process was I wanted to make sure that I checked my biases at the door and focus on listening to the system and really understanding what the system set out to do. Next slide, please. And the system that I found looked a little like this. And it was very complex and comprised of intricate webs of causality that I was interested in finding out where they were going and coming from. Next slide, please, Eleanor. So this is actually a really fun picture because this is just like an overview when I zoom out of my Patica map, what it looked like. And this is after obviously many, many rounds of um, just getting feedback from people uh, through the loop. And this is what it looked like. Obviously, um, there's no way it could all fit on here. So this is all I could get on there for you guys. Uh, next slide. So the next step is that I began to perform a, a CAS analysis, which meant I set out to identify all the key agents in my system and the simple rules that they followed that were driving the resulted possible or the outcomes that we were seeing, which is in generally speaking, the things that were driving uh, the current system that we were finding existed. So the first, the first main agent was uh, the state government. And one of the rules they were following was that they were deferring all the prevention duties, all the suicide prevention duties to the local government. And that was promoting a lot of silos as well as leading to decentralized systems. Social workers was the next uh, agent that I looked at. And I was finding that the rule that they were, the main rule they were following is that they needed to stick to a budget due to the limited resources that they had available, which was leading to them sacrificing low risk patients, which actually they found later became uh, high risk cases due to this neglect. And then the medical providers, another key agent, were bound by the excessive privacy laws that we know currently exist um, in this county uh, or in the state rather, surrounding suicide prevention and disclosure of information surrounding this, um, you know, these deaths. And due to this, we're finding that there was a lack of timeliness in the reporting, which was leading to unreliable suicide data collection. Next slide, please, Eleanor. Now we kind of reached a crossroad, which is that before we could lead into even getting into recommendations, we needed to come up with what uh, I like to, what, what the Cabrera is referred to as the recommendation rubric. So I like to think of it as a litmus test, which is that anything that is going to count as a recommendation must first pass this test. And in this test, what I had is I have a set of uh, limitations that I feel, or rather um, requirements that I feel every recommendation must uh, fulfill before it can be proven uh, to be moved forward with. And all the recommendations that I found that I'm going to present to you today, all, all do not violate all of these things that are set out here in this recommendation rubric. And one of those things is we needed to make sure that the system was moving from a space of being proactive to being reactive. We wanted to make, put an emphasis on inclusivity, which meant that we wanted to focus on both low and high risk patients. And we wanted to unburden the system. So I didn't want to go on and give a recommendation that would further stretch an already stretched system. So we wanted to make sure we're making use of the resources we have, or we were adding funding to the, to the system. And the next thing that we wanted to make sure, I wanted to make sure that we're focusing on was, wanted, I wanted to make sure we were discouraging silos, because that is the main reason for the possible that we see today. Next slide. Um, and now we get into my recommendations. Next slide, please, Elena. So when we step back and we look at my recommendations, the first one that I looked at was I wanted to make sure that we engage policymakers to deploy additional funding into the existing system, as well as to redesign patient intervention protocols so that we can make sure that we're moving towards a proactive system versus a reactive system. 
And I also wanted to make sure that we mandated the standardized intervention, because one of the main issues that I was seeing is that there was a consistent discrepancy across all the systems of the different intervention protocols that were being applied. And I found that this was another major reason why we're failing to see the results that these initiatives are meant to achieve. And another thing that I was finding is to tackle that decentralization of information, which means that we need somebody to be able to walk into the ER today and walk into a therapist's office the next day and all the information from their previous visit has already been shared and is available. And how we can do this is by coming up with a centralized electronic data sharing platform um, to be able to do this. Next slide, please, Elena. So all of this said and done, like the message, uh, the message that I want to leave you all with today is that we all need to remember to be human and to care for one another. I think that the world that we currently live in, we often get so caught up in our daily routines and responsibilities that we forget to check in. Um, but a simple phone call or a message can go a long way in brightening somebody else's day. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this. And yeah, and being patient with me with all of my fantastic technological issues today. <laughs> So those were all fantastic presentations by Vimbai, Uriah, and Jillian. And we do have a couple questions. Um, the first are gonna go to Jillian. And that is, have you applied this model to mothers giving birth or also to foster parents? Um, so that's a really great question, one that I get um, pretty frequently. The larger context for this project is that it is, um, small part of my uh, master's thesis analysis, and that is focusing largely on physical recovery for many of the questions that I um, asked in interviews um, and how physical recovery post birth related to people's leave time. So I am not focusing in this study on foster parents or adoptive parents, but I am very interested in um, exploring this topic further in the future and would love to look at um, that topic a little bit more closely as well for a future project. Great. Um, so the next question is going to go to Vimbai. And this person, um, they asked if this data, the data sharing system that you're talking about, they wonder if it already exists. They're referring to something called Epic. Um, so if you could maybe touch on that. Um, yes, so I don't have the specifics uh, regarding the name of the data uh, sharing platform that we have here in uh, the county, but I am aware that there has been a system that they're using to be able to share electronic data, but we're finding that um, one, a lot of the places don't actually have the resources to be able to access the system, so that might be potentially a funding issue, but we're also finding that the timeliness in which that the data is like put onto the system to enable the sharing is also a major issue, which again could go back to funding because that's more of a staffing issue. Okay, and could to build off of that question um, from your research, like has there um, been any other insights that you found from the medical system and any other silos that you've identified? Mm -hmm. Honestly, that's a, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, one of the main silos, especially when I speak specifically to Ithaca, New York, is just through doing a lot of interviews with all the different uh, initiative leaders that I'm finding here, is that I'm finding that a lot of people are duplicating, you know, efforts. And what I mean by that is that you could speak to one uh, data coalition group that we have that's working towards finding, uh, you know, getting us timely information for suicide prevention. But at the same time, on the other side of the of town, you could have, um, you know, a uh, another smaller group doing something similar. So I wonder, are we, would we be better, is it a better use of resources if we can bring everybody together so we don't have, you know, two groups of people or three groups of people doing the same thing. So outside of just the centralized electronic system, I wonder if there is, you know, a platform where we can have regular check-ins with all the major key players in the city, speaking, speaking specifically to Ithaca, and we can try to make sure that everybody is set out doing something different so we're not wasting resources or time. Interesting. Um, so the next question that I have is going to go to Uriah. Um, and this question asks, um, because Title IX is a federal legislation, how does that interact with the state system? And maybe if you can um, touch on how the federal versus state um, laws work in the United States for international audience, um, if you can just talk about that. All right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as you know, Title IX would be a federal law. 
Um, so of course that would supersede anything that would be in place currently in state legislation. Um, however, there you know is some things happening right now because Title IX does not currently extend to you know trans or non-conforming people or uh, let me rephrase that since it doesn't really extend to protecting sexual orientation or gender identity, for instance, um, you find in places, especially in like more southern states, particularly like Texas or Florida, where there are direct laws in place right now to discriminate against people on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity within the school system. Uh, and there's also this current thing with, you know, how engaged should parents be within that child's curriculum should sex education even be taught and a lot of this is because that's not really covered currently federally um so it, it does differ from state to state but with these new amendments that were proposed last year uh if these are indeed you know adopted then we would see more federal regulation wow um, great answer. So the next question that I have, um, it's can be answered by all of you. And so how about we go one by one? And this question is, what did you find most useful in applying a systems thinking approach to these issues um, of justice and equity? Jillian, do you want to start? Um, sure. Uh, so I think that a lot of what the systems thinking approach did um, to help me uh, kind of synthesize a lot of my thinking about this project, which is um, motivated by questions of justice and equity in large part, was that it allowed me to just put down the facts of what is happening, what um, could happen, and what the ideal situation was. And that um, allowed me to kind of cut through some of my personal biases in making recommendations um, and actually consider perspectives that I hadn't in the past. And it was very helpful for um, doing that. Vimbai. Um, yeah, for me, I think, you know, two things. The first thing is, I think a lot of the current um, standard problem solving methodologies that we apply. So something random would be like, you know, you can solve every problem in five whys. What I find is that those systems lack is they don't really, you know, they don't unpack the layers. They're not, you're not going stage by stage to understand, you know, what are the different things that are, you know, the different factors and how they are interconnected and how those are yielding, you know, the, the, the things that we're seeing, the problems that we're seeing in our social systems. So I appreciate that, you know, systems thinking as a whole, the ABA approach allowed me to be able to go layer by layer and attempt to solve my problem. And most importantly, I think to have the structure was extremely important. So I find that as long as we have a structure to the solve to the problem solving, um, you know, methodology that we're using, it, it makes it easily transferable. Like, for example, we come up with the recommendation rubric to allow us to be able to, you know, hand it over to somebody in the future who can then bring in their recommendations, feed them in and be like, okay, you know what, I know that this is not yielding the right answers because it's violated A, B, C, and D. So I think that structure is definitely important as well. And Uriah? Yeah, so just to quickly answer the question. In terms of like justice and equity, uh, the ABA approach, the agent-based approach, I think really helped me figure out what I should have been looking for. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, like as a person in the LGBT community, um, I tried not to really put any bias into it where possible. I just looked at it from as many perspectives as I could and just tried to rationalize what was literally and currently happening, right? And then, uh, as from by mentioned, uh, and then I used that to help inform some of the recommendations as well as the rubric because the recommendations can change. Those are all very dependent on if these circumstances happen. But the rubric is a good, you know, launching ground for maintaining equity and justice within this caste system. Um, and I hope that answers that. Yeah, great, fantastic. Um, so we 
might have time for one or two more questions. And so this question is for Vimbai, and that is um, after you produced this, um, what you learned from your systems thinking project, did you share this with the organization in Tompkins County and did they how did they respond to it? So um, this is actually a very funny question. So um, as I previously stated that like, you know, this project, you know, has kind of a long history. So it started out as part of a consulting project for me for a separate class. And then I came over to the Cabrera's class and I was just like very fixated and like motivated by this project. I started to move it over to my systems thinking class as well. So upon doing this whole thing and I, I would, um, you know, interact with the stakeholders to get the information for my feedback loops and things like that. I have this final paper. So I went back to my professor uh, for that initial class and I let her know that, you know, we are doing this conference, you know, I am sharing my paper. And she actually informed me that the project has been put on hold because they realized that, um, you know, they were duplicating a lot of efforts and they didn't know which way they wanted to go. So they actually on a pause to kind of reevaluate, which is like the team that was really heading out this um, project. But I have reached out to the Sophie Fund, which is a local big player in here in Ithaca to let them know that this paper will be available for them to use for any future data. So what they will do with it, I'm not so sure and we'll have to check back in, but I am making the research available to them. Wow, great. I'm sure they will appreciate your beautiful mind and your systems thinking approach. Um, and so I think we have time for one more question and this is gonna go to Jillian. Um, and what are the implications of your research and um, on the LGBTQ community as parents? Um, thank you. So um, that question is um, one that I do care about personally and have um, been asked quite a bit. Um, it's a little bit difficult when the numbers statistically of um, our LGBTQ people are so small to get a sample large enough to actually study. But it has been um, attempted and in Sweden, there is a paper by Everton and Boy um, that came out in 2018 that looked a little bit about this. Um, the impact is definitely still different um, in leave taking for the parent that gave birth versus the parent that is not the one that gave birth, but there is a smaller gap in leave taking between mothers and fathers and same sex couples. Um, who are both mothers. Uh, there's not a lot of research on um, male couples or um, uh, lo like more uh, people under the spectrum across the across the gender spectrum, but um, I'm looking forward to more research coming out about that so that it can be an area of study. Wow, fantastic. Um, so we may have time for one more question if we can fit it in. Um, and I think this one is coming from Angela and I think it's for you Vimbai. And it is, have you considered how you could get buy-in for the results of your analysis? Um, um, I think- I don't think, yeah. Great. Yeah, so maybe um, what their question is asking yeah. is, um, I guess you kind of already answered that when you're talking about what you're doing with your report afterwards, but mm -hmm. maybe let's ask about how this could be transferred to other counties um, and other places. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think your research could impact maybe a bigger scope? So um, there's actually something that they're currently doing uh, in Minnesota. So it was actually something that I used in my research as well to kind of inform just understanding the space as a whole of what people are doing for suicide prevention. So I, do, I know that in Minnesota, they currently actually have a system up and the main thing, like a centralized data sharing system. And what's great about it is that it's actually something that everybody can access, but they're using it to kind of uh, drive a zero suicide initiative that they're currently doing. So I, I'm actually, I know that this is something that has you know been tried and tested somewhere else, but I think that definitely a lot of other counties and like states that are not using this could really learn from it. I think just from a healthcare perspective, centralization of data, whether or not that's in suicide prevention, that's in regular, you know, physical health care, I feel like is a good place to be at, especially with where technology is going. Wow. 
Well, that was great. Thank you, Michelle, for moderating that session so beautifully. Um, and thank uh, the three of you, Vimbai, Jillian, and Yuri, for really interesting and thought-provoking, well-thought-out presentations. Uh, so I appreciate that.